Graphic content ahead. Viewer discretion is advised. In the shadowed alleyways of Victorian history, beyond the well-trodden, done-to-death path of figures like Jack the Ripper lies a less traversed road, adorned with the bloody guts of forgotten murder and mayhem. Our first killing occurred eerily right alongside good old Jack's, but we're here for something more. We're here to talk about the street rats inspired by Jack, the downtrodden nobody. We're here for the overworked laborer who snaps, the housewife who freaking loses it. We're here for the tiny tyke psychopath who cut his teeth in an era where innocents died young and they chewed through lead base paid for fun. This is a realm where blood-soaked grit, crushing poverty, and the sweaty stink of ordinary Victorian-era lives converged in the fires of relentless societal pressure, beating and bastardizing humanity into perversely extraordinary acts of darkness and violence. If you want a stale retelling of serial killer glory, this isn't that. But if you want the gory truth of ordinary people becoming extraordinary killers, well then, welcome to Dreadfully Curious. 1887, a year before Jack the Ripper murdered his first victim, the streets of Whitechapel bore witness to another woman's dreadful murder, brought about by the use of an incredibly rare and painful murder weapon, acid. The crime was discovered and reported on the morning of June 28, 1887. It was noticed when a neighbor, Mrs. Gale, became concerned due to an unusual silence from one specific boarding house resident, a young woman by the name of Miriam Angel. Mrs. Gale, along with her son, knocked on Miriam's door but received no response. Sensing something was wrong and finding the door locked, they broke it open and were confronted with the horrific scene. Inside the room, they found Miriam Angel lying dead on her bed, her body showing signs of a violent struggle and horrifying yellow burns visible around her mouth and on her face closer inspection would confirm corrosive burns from nitric acid present both in her throat and on her face. An additional twist moments later, a man was discovered under the dead victim's bed. The man was unconscious and in a state of partial undress. The door had been locked from the inside, but mysteriously the only two occupants both appeared to be victims. More than one person would have wondered at this point what the actual hell was going on. The immediate response to this discovery was to summon the police. The local authorities arrived at the scene to investigate this gruesome murder in Batty Street, Whitechapel. The unconscious man found beneath the bed was identified as Israel Lipsky, a gentleman who resided at the same boarding house as the other victim. He would recover. A boarding house like the one where the crime occurred was a common type of lodging in Victorian England, especially in densely populated urban areas like Whitechapel. These houses were typically large residences converted into lodgings for renters, often accommodating a large number of tenants who rented individual rooms or spaces. The key characteristics of boarding houses included shared common areas such as kitchen, bathroom, and living spaces. Boarding houses served a wide array of people, including workers, immigrants, students, and sometimes transient individuals as well. This diversity reflected the socioeconomic mix of the area and of the time. These communal living scenarios were often more affordable housing options for people who couldn't afford or didn't need a full apartment or house. Renters often included single individuals, newly arrived immigrants, and lower income workers. In the context of this case, the boarding house environment meant that many people lived in close quarters, which led to conflicts or, as was tragically the case here, facilitate criminal activities of convenience. The shared space and thin walls also meant that neighbors like Mrs. Gale could easily become aware of unusual occurrences. Israel Lipsky's story of the events that transpired was a tale wrapped in murder and deceit, but it was also a desperate tale of survival. This was a young man who was Polish and born in Warsaw in 1865. He had found himself tangled in a dreadful robbery murder deep in the dirty heart of London's East End. Over a year before Jack the Ripper prowled the very same streets. Lipsky, a name he adopted in England, came to London seeking a new life. His journey, marred by the struggles of his impoverished family in Warsaw, was marked by determination and resourcefulness. In London, he worked for Mr. Mark Katz, a stick maker, as in walking stick maker. Lipsky had carved out a place for himself in a city teeming with ambition and with desperation. In this case, swift notification of the police helped preserve the crime scene and gather evidence. Initially, it appeared as if they had two victims. Israel was transported for medical care while police took a look at the scene. Miriam Angel, the other victim, was dead. She had burns yellowish in color on her face and around her mouth, indicating a corrosive substance had made contact with the skin. And gruesomely, the burns extended to the inside of her mouth and throat as well. The presence of these burns, including the outside of the mouth and throat area, suggested that the acid was forced upon her versus a covert poisoning or intentional consumption. This was a critical piece of evidence pointing towards a deliberate and malicious act. Nitric acid, also known as aqua fortis, is a highly corrosive and toxic mineral acid with the chemical formula HNO3. Here's a closer look at its properties and uses. 
Nitric acid is a colorless liquid at room temperature, but it can turn yellow over time due to decomposition in nitrogen oxides and water. It is a very strong acid with significant oxidizing properties. This means it can cause oxidation reactions. It reacts vigorously with many organic materials and causes burns upon contact with human skin and tissue. It was widely available in the Victorian era and used commonly in things like jewelry making and crafting metal and wood products. Someone who makes sticks, aka walking sticks or canes, would have known the etching qualities of nitric acid with metals and other uses with wood. They would also be aware of its hazardous nature as a substance. Nitric acid as a weapon is both very unusual and extremely dangerous. Its ingestion or forced consumption would lead to severe internal burns and rapid deterioration of tissues, which can be easily fatal. Specifically, when nitric acid comes into contact with skin or other tissues, it causes chemical burns. The acid rapidly penetrates and destroys cells by breaking down proteins, a process known as protein denaturation, and lipids in cell membranes. This leads to cell death and tissue necrosis. Nitric acid can strip electrons from other molecules in cells, leading to oxidative stress. This disrupts normal cellular functions and can cause further cell damage or death. It also disassociates in tissues to release hydrogen ions, leading to a drop in pH, or something called acidification. This sudden change in pH can denature enzymes and other vital proteins, disrupting the cell's biochemical processes and metabolisms. Nitric acid reacts with water in cells, leading to dehydration of tissues. This chemical reaction can exacerbate the damage caused by acidification and oxidation. Similar to burns caused by heat, nitric acid burns can cause redness, blistering, and the peeling of skin. However, nitric acid burns often have a unique yellowish or orange coloration due to the acid reacting with proteins, or keratin, in the skin. This aligns with Miriam's injuries, the yellow chemical burns around her mouth. The effects of this type of acid injury would include deep ulcers and lesions, depending on the concentration of the acid and the duration of exposure. The damage often extends deeper into tissues than thermal burns, which are those burns caused by heat or flame. The area surrounding the exposure often becomes inflamed, swollen, and extremely painful. This pain can be more intense and last longer than thermal burns due to a process of ongoing tissue damage. While nitric acid can actually cause dehydration of tissues, it can also damage blood vessels, leading to bleeding, especially in cases of deep tissue damage. However, the bleeding can be less profuse compared to other injuries like cuts or lacerations due to a coagulation effect that acid has on blood and tissue. It can create a nasty, squishy mess of our tissues, and exposure can certainly become incompatible with life. Needless to say, this stuff is nasty. And we aren't even considering some of the secondary reactions caused by nitric acid exposure. The forced ingestion of nitric acid would have caused severe chemical burns to the throat, or pharynx, and the upper airway, or larynx. This would have led to significant swelling and damage in these tissues. The swelling, edema, in response to chemical burns in the pharynx and larynx rapidly led to narrowing or complete obstruction of the airway. This prevented air from entering the lungs, effectively cutting off the supply of oxygen. The use of nitric acid as a weapon represents a particularly heinous and twisted act due to the excruciating pain and severe injuries it can cause. The complexity and brutality of using this substance is certainly noteworthy. Back to the case, the facade that was Lipsky's account of a horrible robbery murder crumbled. If he was to be believed, he and Miss Angel had been assaulted, robbed, extorted, and forced to consume acid and poison at the hands of at least two men. The men had threatened, bantered back and forth, with some truly evil monologue occurring. But this fantastical tale was debunked and disbelieved by police almost as soon as it was uttered. The evidence, they said, pointed to Lipsky. He had killed Miriam Angel in a botched robbery in the middle of the night. In either a failed attempt at his own life, or so as to give credence to his story, he drank some amount of acid or other compound himself. He faced trial, was convicted, and was sentenced to death. All appeals to spare his life or reverse his conviction failed. The day before his execution, he confessed the harrowing, supposed truth to Reverend S. Singer. In a desperate bid for money, he had entered Miriam Angel's room, intending to rob her. He explicitly denies nefarious intentions of a sexual nature. Caught in the act by her waking up, he silenced her with brutal blows to the head and forced nitric acid down her throat, a substance he had purchased under the guise of coloring sticks. Again, walking sticks. In a twisted turn of events, Lipsky reported that he had consumed the remaining acid, only to be found alive lurking beneath the bed where Miriam lay lifeless. The confusion laid bare the supposed true motive of the crime, a robbery turned murder driven by dire financial straits and a moment of unchecked greed. Lipsky's actions painted a portrait of a man pushed to the edge whose choices spiraled into irreversible tragedy. But more than one thing stinks about his confession. Analyzing the confession of Israel Lipsky and the surrounding circumstances from a behavioral perspective, especially considering it was made the night before his execution, brings several aspects into focus. First, the confession in question occurred a day before the confessor knew he would die. 
It's common for individuals facing imminent execution to make confessions or statements that they believe might lead to clemency or a commutation of their sentence. Additionally, a human being's reaction to knowledge of their impending doom is often tied to deeply held beliefs. Why someone says and does what they do in the final hours of their life in many ways is for them to know and for us to guess. The existential set of experiences facing people approaching death can lead to partial truths or complete fabrications, as the primary motive is self-preservation of some kind, almost always. That said, behaviors at the end of life can take a seemingly nonsensical turn as well. Lipsky's confession included an explicit denial of sexual intentions. This could be an attempt to portray his actions in a less heinous light, potentially influencing perceptions of his character and the nature of his crime. On this, I do not believe him. He was found in a state of partial undress, and several other elements we cover shortly make me doubt this part of his story significantly. Next, in his confession, he states his motive was desperate robbery, a compulsion driven by the sting of the era's brutal poverty. There's little doubt that there's valid motive here, and the threat of crushing poverty was a factor for many criminals of the era. Well, but one critical thing causes me pause. Lipsky, when he first entered the room of sleeping Miriam, he locked the door from the inside. This is a critical point in my mind. In a typical robbery scenario, maintaining an easy escape route may be preferred. Locking the door may suggest a different intention, possibly ensuring privacy while also preventing the victim from escaping, which aligns more with a premeditated assault and or murder than with a simple robbery. Additionally, Lipsky's actions post-crime, including hiding under the bed and purportedly consuming acid himself, suggest panic or sudden realization of the gravity of a situation. These actions could be interpreted as a last-minute decision to avoid apprehension and consequences. I believe the true motives and sequence of events differ significantly from the narrative presented in his last-minute confession. From my perspective, if he consumed any acid at all, it was with the express intent of preserving his life and freedom. He was found partially undressed under the bed of a woman he had just murdered with acid. When he entered, he locked the door. His primary motive was assault and or murder. Robbery was an important but secondary motive for him. A slight puzzler for me though is the acid. As a stick maker, Lipsky would have been familiar with aqua fortis. Its use as a murder weapon is really uncommon and suggests a strange and disorganized premeditation or a highly unusual criminal mind. I don't believe his stated reasons for having it, such as buying it with the intention towards himself. I think it much more likely he planned to silence, immobilize, and morally injure Miriam or another victim. He wanted to gain quick control over that room and all entities in it. Perhaps the thought of using this substance on an unsuspecting and sleeping woman excited him, or scratched some dreadful killer's itch. But regardless of why, and irregardless of what made this killer tick, Lady Justice exacted her opposite, if not always equal, reaction. On August 22, 1887, Lipsky's life met its grim end at Newgate Prison, the final act of a deadly drama. His execution, a spectacle of morbid fascination, stirred some debate, but left less than a lasting impression on London's criminal history. Among his last words were, I am guilty. The execution itself was reported as extremely efficient. The six-foot drop had been precisely measured to deliver the fatal kinetic force to break the neck instantly. All occurred as planned. The event was reported as painless to Mr. Lipsky and a mathematical nicety overall. Not all hangings and executions of the era occurred as intended. Coming up, we talk about a man who was tried thrice and died once, but then also another man who hung for his crime three times and lived. So, please do keep watching. The tale of Mr. Israel Lipsky and Miss Miriam Angel is a stark reminder of the fine line between survival and moral descent. It speaks to the cheapness, some thought of human life in the Victorian era. It reminds us that both innocence and a capability for twisted torture often lurk down the same shared and shadowed hallway. We best watch our step. In the dim, gaslit streets of Victorian London, where shadows whispered tales of horror and despair, a young boy named Robert Allen Coombs found himself ensnared in a bloody web of fate not entirely of his own dark making. Born in the gritty embrace of Bethnal Green, his life was a tapestry of tragedy woven with threads of neglect, pain, and the sinister allure of many dreadfuls. Robert would conspire with his younger brother Nathaniel to brutally murder their mother. Known as Natty, the younger brother dwelt in the periphery of this grim tale. As you'll see, while well, what precipitated mother's murder was purportedly a beating she'd given Natty, the crime's true origin is deeper and more complicated. In the early hours of Saturday, July 6, 1895, Robert Coombs Sr., father and the head of the household, departed the family home embarking on what was a routine extended period of time away. Robert Sr. was a steward on a transatlantic steamer, and him away was normal. The household on this day consisted of 13-year-old Robert Jr., the budding psychopath, and older brother by one year to also present Natty. And of course, dear mom, Emily Harrison Coombs, life bringer to these two miscreants, was also at home. At about 3.45 a.m. on Sunday, July 7, 1895, 13-year-old Robert retrieved a knife he had concealed in the home a week previous. 
He entered his mother's room, bludgeoning her first with a truncheon, which is basically a small wooden club, then stabbed her in the chest at least twice. He then fell asleep in her room, the sick shit, before sharing the news that he had murdered their mother with his brother Natty at around 9 a.m. on Sunday, July 8, 1895. Natty initially didn't believe Robert, but soon saw with his own eyes the bloodied body of his mother. Thing is, at least based on some historical accounts, Emily is still alive at this point. At 9 a.m., her groans of pain were audible to the boys, but they callously covered her head and departed the home together. With her mother dead or well on her way to dead, and dear old dad out at sea, the boys had found themselves with a sick bit of what might have felt like freedom. Some time and space for boys to be boys. In the tragic case of Emily Harrison Coombs, the injuries inflicted by her son Robert Allen Coombs were both brutal and ultimately fatal. Let's zoom in a bit on how injuries like this can harm the body. The initial bludgeoning with a truncheon or club caused severe trauma to the head, potentially resulting in skull fractures, brain injury, and internal bleeding. Subsequent stabbing in the chest would have compounded these injuries. Stab wounds to the chest often cause damage to the heart, lungs, or major blood vessels, leading to rapid blood loss, impaired oxygen delivery, and organ failure. Emily Coombs was alive hours after being stabbed, so despite some reporting of the time, it's likely that the stab wounds did not directly puncture her heart, but rather caused other critical internal injuries. A likely scenario is that the knife damaged major blood vessels in the lungs, leading to internal bleeding or what's called pneumothorax or collapsed lung. In the case of lung injury, blood or air filled the chest cavity, impeding normal lung function and leading to respiratory distress. Here's why that's bad. In a healthy lung, the chest cavity is a vacuum with lower pressure compared to the outside air, helping keep the lungs expanded. The vacuum is created through muscle contractions. When we inhale, the diaphragm, the main muscle of respiration, contracts and moves downward. And the muscles between the ribs, we call these intercostal muscles, contract and expand the chest wall. This expansion increases the volume of the chest cavity, creating lower pressure inside compared to the outside air. The pressure difference causes air to flow into the lungs, which are drawn to expand into the enlarged chest cavity. When these muscles relax during exhalation, the process reverses, pushing air out of the lungs. The pressure difference between the inside of the lungs and the chest cavity is crucial for normal lung functions. A punctured lung disrupts this delicate balance, allowing air to enter the chest cavity, equalizing the pressure between the cavity and the lung. This loss of negative pressure in the chest cavity prevents the lung from expanding properly, severely impacting the ability to breathe and oxygenate blood. Such a lung injury would be extremely painful. You'd initially see an increase in respiration to compensate for the injury. Labored breathing, wheezing, and other dreadful sounds would then proceed in some cases cyanosis, where the skin turns bluish due to poor oxygenation of the blood. Overall, internal bleeding from damaged blood vessels could lead to hypovolemic shock where the body loses a significant amount of blood, reducing oxygen supply to vital organs even further. Over time, these conditions, if not medically treated, lead to organ failure and death. The combination of blunt force trauma and penetrating injuries likely caused immediate life-threatening complications, but in Emily's case, a slower, painful progression to death as indicated by her prolonged utterances of agony. Zooming back out to the case, the brothers enveloped in secrecy continued their lives with eerie normalcy. The steps they took after the murder are chilling. The following Monday, July 9, Robert took one gold sovereign from his dead mother's purse. He approached a neighbor and exchanged the coin for smaller denominations. He and his brother then spent the money, attending a cricket match at Lord's Cricket Ground in St. John's Wood. By Tuesday, the third day following the murder, the body would be showing the early signs of decomposition. This includes changes to skin discoloration and the onset of rigor mortis, depending on the environmental factors such as temperature and humidity. It's at this point Robert put quicklime on his mother's body. This suggests an attempt to hasten decomposition and mitigate the smell of decay. Quicklime, calcium oxide, is known to react with moisture and can dry out soft tissues which might slow bacterial growth and consequently the decomposition process. This action indicates a rudimentary understanding of body decomposition and a calculated effort to conceal the crime for as long as possible. That said, quicklime doesn't destroy a body rapidly and is not effective at concealing signs of decomposition. But A for effort, you little psycho. Robert would secure the help of a family friend, John Fox, who had some cognitive issues and was apparently also quite gullible. Fox helped Robert by pawning family valuables at several different pawn shops. Fox would hawk a gold pocket watch at George Fish's pawn shop at 545 Commercial Road in Poplar. He then went just down the road to a neighboring pawn shop at 554 Commercial Road and pawned a silver watch. Then a third stop further away to cash a mandolin. Fox would stay at the family home, the body of Mrs. Coombs rotting upstairs. The boys continued to live out their daily lives. They went to the theater, they played cricket in the backyard, and they even paid the family's rent. 
However, their first attempt at adulting would end about as badly as it had begun. By July 17th, their enterprising but murderous ruse crumbled. Emily's sister-in-law, after persistent visits to their house at 35 Cave Road, discovered the ghastly scene, her sister-in-law's decomposing body. Using a spare key to open the locked bedroom door, she was met with a vision of a deceased loved one crawling in maggots. The police, summoned by alarmed neighbors, arrived at the scene, marking the end of the brothers' grim secret. Robert and John Fox, the family acquaintance, were arrested at the scene. Nathaniel, initially escaping through a window, was also apprehended. The investigation revealed a chilling blend of premeditation and improvisation. From the acquisition of the murder weapon, which the boys bought a week before the murder with this purpose in mind, to the stoic use of quicklime and the calculated pawning of items for financial gain. The trial, commencing on September 9, 1895 at the Old Bailey, delved into Robert's mental state and the motivations behind the crime. The jury, grappling with the complex interplay of a distorted mind and a heinous act, ultimately found Robert guilty. He was sentenced to incarceration at Broadmoor Hospital, the youngest inmate at the time, while Nathaniel was acquitted of involvement and Mr. Fox was found faultless as well. There was what we might call mitigating factors present day, but medical evidence indicated that he was relatively sane at the time of the murder. There was premeditation, recognition of wrong, attempts to cover up the crime, and a lengthy period where it took active efforts of deception to keep up the secret. Now this next bit is some of what we know may have influenced young Robert Coombs. None are an excuse for his behavior, but many may be a contributing reason. Robert Allen Coombs was pulled from his mother's womb by forceps January 6, 1882. Being a forceps baby in the Victorian era was as grisly as it sounds and meant a higher prevalence of birth injuries due to the use of those forceps. Forceps are a tool that resemble large tongs and they're used to assist in difficult deliveries. Forceps were applied to the baby's head to help guide it out of the birth canal. In this era, without modern medical practices and monitoring, the use of forceps could easily lead to various injuries such as skull fractures, nerve damage, and brain injury. These injuries could have long-term effects, including neurological problems, cognitive impairments, or developmental delays. The presence of visible scars on Robert Coombs' temples at the age of 13 resulting from the forceps delivery suggests that his trauma at birth was significant. Such lasting physical marks indicate that the force used during delivery was considerable, potentially leading to more serious underlying injuries, both physical and neurological. This kind of trauma, especially in an era with limited medical understanding and intervention capabilities, very well could have had a profound impact on his development and behavior. Due to the trauma of Robert's birth, his parents were cautioned about striking him in the head by their physician. If we pause for a moment, this fact is revealing. In the Victorian era, corporal punishment was a very common disciplinary method in both homes and schools. The specific advice from a doctor to avoid hitting Robert Coombs in the head indicates that such physical punishment was absolutely the accepted norm. This advice reveals not only the prevalent attitudes towards child discipline at the time, but also an awareness of Robert's particular vulnerability. The threshold for such advice was significantly higher in the Victorian era. The fact that such a warning was necessary underscores the harshness of typical disciplinary practices during this period. But whatever his condition or disability, it's not conceivable that Robert Coombs would have escaped the practices of corporal punishment common in the Victorian era. Such disciplinary methods were widespread and socially accepted, both in educational settings and at home. They didn't need to beat the boy in the head to beat him. Corporal punishment, historically common in child rearing and education, to be crystal clear, never helps a child. The literature is very clear. Physically hitting children is recognized for its detrimental effects. Research has consistently shown that physical discipline can lead to increased aggression and violent behavior in children. Instead of teaching self-control or responsibility, it often instills fear, resentment, and anger. Corporal punishment also undermines the development of trust and secure attachments between children and caregivers. Over time, children subjected to physical discipline may develop skewed understanding of how to resolve conflicts and express emotion, potentially carrying patterns of aggression and violence into adulthood. There is a significant consensus among psychologists and child development experts that nonviolent positive disciplinary techniques are far more effective and beneficial for a child's overall emotional and psychological well-being. We know this now, but in the Victorian era, physical beatings to discipline children were common and accepted. The term labile is an apt description of Robert Coombs' emotional state. His excitement and positive anticipation of the trial, like he was super legit stoked to be facing murder charges and death by hanging. That anticipation contrasts sharply with his emotional breakdowns when he went on to discussing his missing cats. This lability or rapid and unpredictable emotional change can be indicative of underlying psychiatric issues, further complicating the understanding of his mental state and behavior both leading up to and at the time of the murder. 
The emotional ability was present long before the murders as well, and worsened when Robert's father was out at sea, which again was often. This more than hints at Robert having adjustment issues, so much so that he was prescribed potassium bromide, a substance historically used for various medical conditions, including epilepsy and nervous disorders. In this era, it was commonly administered in varying doses, depending on the patient's age, condition, and tolerance. For children, especially in the Victorian era, dosages would have been less standardized and more dependent on individual physician practices. Long-term use, particularly at higher doses, could lead to side effects like drowsiness, lethargy, or even more severe neurological effects. Those could include headaches, irritability, impaired thinking, and personality changes. This wasn't an uncommon drug for such use at the time, and we can't know what role it may have played on Robert's psyche. But when considered with other factors, it is interesting. Maybe you have thoughts on this, or a source or important perspective I didn't find. I'd love to hear it. Let me know your thoughts in the comments below. One final factor, the boy marked at birth by the forceps that ushered him into his bleak existence, bore the scars not just on his temples but deep within himself. Haunted by headaches that drummed a relentless rhythm of suffering, Robert found solace in the lurid tales of Jack the Ripper, the very embodiment of the era's macabre fascination with death. Robert Coombs, at the age of 12, made a complicated journey alone to the trial of James Connum Reed, known as the South End Murderer. This trial took place at Essex Assizes in Calmsford. Reed was accused and subsequently found guilty of the murder of Florence Dennis. This trial, which Coombs went to great lengths to witness, reflected his early and unsettling interest in violent crime and criminal proceedings. He also loved Penny Dreadfuls. Penny Dreadfuls were cheap, serialized publications popular in Victorian Britain, particularly among the young and working class audiences. Priced at just a penny, they were accessible and affordable. These publications often featured sensationalized stories filled with adventure, crime, and the supernatural. The content was typically lurid with a focus on the exploits of criminals, detectives, and other dramatic characters. Their sensational nature and graphic storytelling made them controversial, often criticized for their perceived negative influence on the morals of young readers. Despite this, Penny Dreadfuls played a significant role in popular culture of the time. They also, believe it or not, are a bit of an inspiration for the satire of this channel. So if that's your vibe, please do keep watching. Here comes the twist I wasn't ready for. Robert was spared the noose, but was indefinitely committed to Broadmoor Hospital for the criminally insane. He would serve 17 years, was freed at age 30, and emigrated to Australia. He would fight in the First World War, be awarded the Medal of Honor, and spent his later years as a farmer and a music teacher. Robert died at Coffs Harbor Hospital on May 7, 1949, at the age of 67, buried at Coffs Harbor Historical Cemetery, New South Wales, Australia. The at first and sometimes tragic case of Robert Coombs reminds us of a profound and unsettling truth. His journey from forceps baby in the muck and shite of Victoria and England to a war hero and music teacher in Australia suggests that, given a similar dreadful set of circumstances, perhaps all humans are capable of both acts of membership and of murder. In the damp and sooty morning of May 23, 1895, the town of Pontefract, Shrouded in the typical gloom of an industrial English town, awoke to a tragedy that would etch itself in the town's somber history. In a modest house occupied by Joshua Bowen, a hard-working miner and his family, a scene of unimaginable horror unfolded. Shortly after nine o'clock in the morning, the air, heavy with the weight of impending doom, was pierced by a frantic summons for PC Beavers. Upon his arrival, he was met with a sight that would haunt even the most seasoned constable. Joshua Bowen, in a state of shock, grappled with the reality of his wife's actions. He stammered, she has put the children somewhere, as he restrained his wife. The constable's search led to a heart-wrenching discovery. A little boy, bearing the brutal marks of an attack with the blunt end of an axe, lay horribly injured, but alive. His innocent voice, trembling with fear, uttered the chilling words, Mama's done it with the chopper. The horror escalated in the scullery, or washroom, where the constable found a peggy tub. There, in a haunting juxtaposition of innocence and death, lay two young children, two-year-old Joseph Patrick and nine-month-old Joshua, submerged in a shallow grave of tub water. Let's zoom in a bit on why this is a particularly dreadful set of circumstances for young humans. At nine months, a child's lungs are still developing, and their capacity for oxygen remains limited. While slightly better than a newborn, their ability to cope with water inhalation is still critically low. The youngest, Joshua, would have had a very limited ability to hold his breath. His instinctive response upon entering the water could have been to inhale deeply, quickly leading to drowning. But there's another dreadful possibility as well, worth mentioning. The bradycardic response, also known as the diving reflex, is an automatic physical reaction that occurs in humans and other animals when submerged in water. 
particularly cold water. This reflex involves several changes in the body, primarily bradycardia, a slowing of the heart rate, and peripheral vasoconstriction. The blood vessels in the extremities, arms, and legs constrict, redirecting blood to vital organs like the heart and brain. When this response is triggered, the survival reflex is to hold your breath and open your eyes. This response is strongest in infants and gradually lessens as we age. For a nine-month-old child, the bradycardic response would still be quite pronounced. The reflex is an evolutionary adaptation that helps conserve oxygen, allowing for longer time underwater without breathing. We share this reflex with other mammals, actually. It's an interesting bit of evolutionary medley shining through. However, it's important to note that this reflex does not prevent drowning. It merely and only maybe just slows the process. A child, especially one as young as nine months, cannot hold their breath voluntarily, and they lack the skills and strength to do much else. Cruelly, this reflex could have allowed small Joshua to survive underwater slightly longer than his older two-year-old sibling, Joseph Patrick, despite him being younger and more vulnerable in other ways. We can't know the exact chain of events that unfolded beneath the filthy film of that tub of Victorian wash water. And we are dealing with estimation and possibilities here. But remember, Mrs. Mary Bone couldn't be physically restrained by her husband. And you'll soon hear she exhausted police kicking and screaming the whole way to jail. She was strong enough and in such state that dispatching both children, even in tandem at the same time, was more than possible. All that said, somewhat mysteriously, no signs of physical trauma were noted. They were cold, lifeless, and had been dead for some time. They were very dead, in fact, but with no signs of fight or struggle on them. If you've got thoughts on this piece, let me know in the comments below. That morning, a Wednesday, started with the cries of the children and then wife and mother Mary screaming, I've lost my children. Joshua Sr., dad and husband, darted about, finding first little Joe bashed in the head by the blunt end of an axe. He sent for neighbors, one of whom happened to be a constable. He likely heard another of his children then utter, Mama put them in the back kitchen somewhere. Then the constable found the bodies, face up in nine inches of water. The mother, Mary Bowen, lost in the throes of what appeared to be insanity, was a puzzle of anguish and disarray. She was off the rails, as it were, and really put up a hell of a fight with the cops and her husband. Detained with great difficulty, she was conveyed to the police station, her actions leaving a wake of sorrow and unanswered questions. Joshua, the father, is reported to have felt the calamity deeply, weeping constantly and bitterly at the horror that had befallen his household. The Bowen family recently relocated from Staffordshire, and only three months' residence to Pontefract, bore the marks of recent turmoil. A fortnight prior, a marital quarrel had led Mary to leave, seeking refuge with friends in Leicester, only to return to the heart of her family's destruction. But according to the husband, the night that preceded this grim nightmare was uneventful. The trial held at Lee's Assizes on July 29 unveiled the harrowing details to captivated and horrified audience. The grim portrait of a mother driven to the edge of sanity, culminating in the drowning of her two youngest children and the near-fatal axe attack on another. The jury, faced with the task of unraveling the threads of sanity and maternal love gone awry, reached a verdict of insanity. Mary Bowen, a woman of 33 years, was thus removed from society, her fate sealed by the decree of Her Majesty's pleasure. We don't know for sure what may have contributed to her behavior. We don't actually know her ultimate fate either, but some interesting possibilities shortly. In the bleak landscape of Victorian England, where industrial smog and societal inequities clouded the lives of many, the case of Mrs. Mary Bowen stands as a grim testament to the era's harsh realities. The potential contributing factors to her tragic actions are as complex as they are speculative. Here are a few possibilities. Living in an industrial town, the Bowen family would have been engulfed in the challenges of the era, long working hours, limited resources, and possibly even hazardous living conditions. The relentless grind of a miner's life, as faced by Joshua Bowen, could strain any family, both emotionally and financially. Victorian society's understanding of mental health was primitive at best. Conditions like postpartum depression or psychosis were often unrecognized or misdiagnosed. Mary's apparent mental breakdown and violent actions could have been the culmination of untreated psychological distress. The era's medical practices were rudimentary. The use of potent pharmaceuticals like laudanum and opium tincture was common, often without proper understanding of their effects or appropriate standards of care. If Mary was using such substances, they could have significantly altered her mental state. Victorian women also faced intense societal pressures, with expectations to conform to strict roles and behaviors. Mary's role as a minor's wife, coupled with the responsibility of motherhood, might have been overwhelming, especially without a supportive community, as evidenced by her recent relocation. The family's recent move from Staffordshire hints at a lack of support network. Marital conflicts, as indicated by Mary leaving the family home briefly, could have exacerbated her sense of isolation and despair. There is even the possibility of contaminants. Living in an industrial town, the family could have been exposed to various pollutants, 
which might have affected their physical and mental health. We can make an informed guess about what happened to Mary. We know she was tried at Leeds, and so she likely would have been committed to one of the larger asylums in Yorkshire or a nearby county. Some of the prominent asylums in the area during that time included the West Riding Pauper Lunatic Asylum, later known as High Roids Hospital, near Leeds, and the Menston Asylum. These facilities were typical of the era, often large, imposing buildings set in expansive grounds. I don't know more about Mary, but maybe you do. Perhaps you're a local expert or took the next step in this case. Maybe you just have a theory about what led her to snap. Let us know in the comments below. In the aftermath, the town, with its industrial heartbeat and coal-stained soul, carried on, but the echoes of that tragic day lingered in the streets. Actually, that's not quite right. I'm glad you and I got to know Mary a little bit today, but to be clear, it was 19th century Victorian England. Mrs. Mary Bowen and the crimes of that day actually very quickly faded into the already violent tapestry of the broader Victorian era. A wisp of bloody disgusting in a sea of grim realities. Nestled alongside reporting of a brutal murder arson, we find the story of victim Sarah McFarlane and her killer Augustus Dolmus. This tale of one-way romance epitomizes the Victorian era's duality, a time where the veil separating human love from inhuman murder was very thin. In the shadowy nighttime hours of Monday, May 6, 1844, Battersea Bridge became the silent witness to a tale of bloodshed and betrayal. Sarah McFarlane, a 43-year-old widow known for her kindness and generosity, lived in the Battersea Road area. Such generous spirit, however, in an era of thieving bastards, isn't without risks, as we will soon see. Ellen Gibson, Sarah's sister, last saw her around 1 o'clock in the afternoon on the day of the murder. As was her way, reports indicate she socialized and interacted with members of the community for much of the day. Around 10.30 p.m., a toll man at the Battersea side of the bridge encountered Sarah in a harrowing state. She was drenched in her own blood, blood still spurting from a wound on her neck as she staggered towards him. As she staggered towards him, she reportedly said, the Frenchman did it. This statement implicated a man she knew well, Augustus Stalmus, a Frenchman and a townie who she had been seen with earlier in the day. The generous Sarah, you see, had befriended the Dalmas family and served as a supportive, almost motherly role to the motherless children. She was not, however, interested romantically in Augustus Dalmas. Accounts of the time indicate that a possible motive for the attack was a proposal of marriage or romance from Dalmas that Sarah rejected. She was quickly taken to Swan Public House nearby, where she sadly succumbed to her injuries. In the Victorian era, public houses or pubs, yes, those pubs, were sometimes used for medical emergencies, especially in situations where immediate medical assistance was needed and a hospital or a doctor's office was not readily accessible. Pubs were central to many communities and were more than just places for drinking. They were often the nearest public space where people could gather for various purposes, including dealing with emergencies. The presence of people and the likelihood of finding someone to help made them practical locations for dealing with urgent situations, like the aftermath of an assault or an accident. Dr. Connor, a physician, examined the victim, revealing a deep lethal wound on Sarah's throat in a position suggesting an attack from behind with a sharp instrument. The nature of the wound ruled out any possibility of self-injury. The lethal wound on Sarah McFarlane's throat, described by Dr. Connor, was indicative of a deliberate attack with a sharp instrument. This kind of deep neck wound would cause significant damage to major blood vessels, leading to profuse bleeding. Such a wound would rapidly lead to critical loss of blood, causing shock and organ failure. The blood loss from such a wound would initially lead to a reduction in blood pressure, making it difficult for the heart to pump blood effectively through the body. This decreased blood flow would result in diminished oxygen delivery to vital organs, including the brain. In response, the body attempts to compensate by increasing the heart rate and constricting blood vessels to maintain blood pressure and flow to essential organs. However, with a major injury and without very prompt medical intervention to stop the bleeding, these compensating mechanisms eventually fail, leading to unconsciousness and death. Given the location and the severity of the wound, death would likely have been caused by a combination of massive blood loss and shock. The fact that Sarah was able to speak and identify her assailant suggests that the wound, while fatal, did not immediately incapacitate her. This indicates that the vital areas of the brain responsible for speech and consciousness remained functional for a short period of time, at least, after the assault occurred. Dalmas, meanwhile, was on the loose and appeared to be grappling with the guilt and confusion of his crisis. His daughter, Charlotte, recounted a distressing encounter with her father shortly after the murder. Pale and agitated, Dolmas first confessed to poisoning Sarah, then retracted his statement, leaving Charlotte with a bleeding hand from an already bloody knife that he had held in his hand. Following this encounter, Dolmas disappeared into the night, evading initial capture. 
The aftermath of the crime was tragic. Carolyn, Thomas's eldest daughter, overwhelmed by the news of her father's crime, descended into insanity. Meanwhile, law enforcement intensified their search for Dalmas. He would actually interact with several people after the murder, including one of his daughters, who, as mentioned, was cut grasping for her father's shaking hands. Hands in which the sharp, bloody murder weapon was still firmly clenched. But he eventually was captured. He eventually was convicted and was sentenced to death. But unlike the other hopeless romantic you'll hear about in our next story, Human Compassion won this day. Thomas was granted clemency at Her Majesty's pleasure, and it appears escaped the gallows. This was due in no small part to appeals for mercy from his daughters. Sarah McFarlane, a woman who had extended her kindness to a family in need, met a brutal end at the hands of the head of that very same household. A desperate man's romantic interest and his greed for the support that can come from such a kind woman has snuffed out a light in a time already far too full of darkness. In the bleak winter of 1883 in the rural tranquility of Clonboo County, Galway, a sinister plot unfurled, casting a shadow over the Moylan household. Michael Donnelly, a man entangled in the clandestine affair with Mrs. Moylan, found himself at the heart of a heinous crime. The unsuspecting victim, John Moylan, had recently returned from America only to discover some unsettling changes to his once peaceful farm and family life. His wife had gotten lonely, you see. On the fateful evening of December 19, 1883, John Moylan and his wife ventured out for a walk, only to be intercepted by a grim fate. In a harrowing sequence of events, Moylan was mercilessly shot dead. His life extinguished in an instant. His wife, thrown into a vortex of grief and fear, initially claimed a stranger, not her lover, Downley, had committed the atrocious act. As suspicion mounted, both Mrs. Moylan and Michael Downley were arrested. In a shocking turn, Mrs. Moylan, amidst the legal proceedings, accused him of the murder. Downey, as the cold-blooded assassin who, after silencing her husband, threatened her life as well. The trial mired in controversy and conflicting testimonies spanned across multiple sessions. The jury found themselves deadlocked, unable to reconcile a web of deceit and half-truths that shrouded the case. The widow Moylan's role oscillated between that of a bereaved wife and a conspirator, her narrative wavering under the weight of her own secrets and fears. Downey's subsequent trial was no less tumultuous. The air was thick with tension as the jury deliberated the scales of justice struggling to balance amidst the murky waters of love, betrayal, and political intrigue. Downey maintained his innocence, weaving a narrative of mistaken identity and alleging a fatal error in supposed Republican plot to assassinate another. However, the veil of deceit was lifted at last on the eve of his execution. In a final confession, Downey admitted the murder of John Moylan, dispelling the fabricated tales of political assassinations. He expressed remorse for his actions, seeking forgiveness and absolution as he faced his impending doom. On January 16, 1885, the gallows at Galway Prison bore witness to the final act of a tragic saga. Executioner James Berry carried out the sentence and, with the fall of the trapdoor, Michael Downey's life was extinguished. The story, which began as a tale of forbidden love in a time of Victorian viciousness, ended in a rather timeless example of murderous passion and jealousy. In the eerie silence of January 1885, the secluded house of Gluadu, a former monastery, became the scene of a grisly triple murder. The victims were the unsuspecting Dr. Delahague, his paralytic mother, and their maid, the only occupants of this isolated dwelling in the French countryside. Their bodies were discovered the morning after the crime by a shepherd who regularly delivered letters from the post to this location. The details of those crimes were horrific. Delahake was found at home with his head nearly severed from his body, indicating deep and forceful cuts were used. Moreover, it became clear that after his death, his killer or killers has scratched his face and eyes, an act likely intended to mislead investigators into thinking there was a struggle, perhaps suggesting a defensive act involving his also dead servant girl. The young servant, Celestine Beauvalet, was equally mutilated. This indicates a level of violence that went beyond mere killing. It was an act of extreme brutality. The elderly bedridden mother was not spared. The murderer initially suffocated her, possibly according to accounts by placing their bloodied hands directly over her mouth. Other accounts of the time indicate that additional extortions and offers of money were discussed before she was ultimately killed. There was also a calculated effort to stage the crime scene. The post-mortem mutilation of Mr. Delahaye and the false depiction of a struggle with the servant girl were likely done to create a misleading narrative about the nature of the crime. The prime suspects, a pair of men by the name of Arnold and Gengi, masked their murderous intentions under the guise of selling plants. 
I know the gory details of their fates, but I actually wasn't able to confirm their full names. More on that later. While the welcoming Delahaye unsuspectingly corked a bottle of wine and offered to his guests, he was viciously struck down. Hearing the commotion, his maid descended the stairs only to be strangled by the men. The aged mother, bedridden and defenseless, was the final victim of this ruthless act. Genyi, a notorious poacher, drew attention with sudden lavish spending and soon became the focus of suspicion when Mr. Delahaye's watch was found in his cottage along with a bloodstained shirt belonging to Arnold. Under the weight of the evidence, Arnold confessed to the murderous crime, while Monsieur Genyi maintained his innocence under questioning and trial. The accused trial at the Troyes Assizes drew considerable attention. While Arnold was condemned to a life of hard labor, Genyi faced a grimmer fate. He was sentenced to death, a judgment carried out by guillotine on a July morning in 1885. A large crowd bore witness to his execution. This is an interesting bit of true crime butchery, to be sure, but actually we're here to look deeper. Keep watching as we near some of the grotesque post-execution experiments that befell this convicted killer's head. First, zooming in a bit on the guillotine. This is a device that consists of a tall, upright frame from which a heavy blade is suspended. The blade is positioned at the top of the frame and held in place by a release mechanism. The frame usually measures around 14 feet in height. The blade itself is angled and weighted, designed to ensure a quick and efficient decapitation. It typically weighs over 80 pounds and is angled at 45 degrees to provide a clean, single-stroke cut. Below the blade, there's a device called the lunette. It's a wooden yoke with a hole through which the condemned person's neck is placed. The lunette is hinged and can be opened to position the neck and then closed to secure the individual in place. During an execution, the condemned person is secured with the neck and the lunette. Once everything is set, the executioner activates the release mechanism, causing the blade to fall swiftly and sever the person's head from their body. The design of the guillotine ensures that death is almost instantaneous and, in theory, painless. The guillotine was initially conceived as a more humane method of execution compared to the often unpredictable and painful methods previously used. Its use became widespread during the Reign of Terror in France, where it became a symbol of the revolutionary period's harsh justice. Over time, the guillotine became synonymous with mass execution and the violence of the revolution. But as a punishment, there was an era where this device was seen even revered as a symbol of equity. In some parts and places of the past, a quick death by axe or sword was reserved for the wealthy or well-known offenders. An often dreadful end via hanging by short drop was the standard. The terms short drop and long drop refer to two different methods used in hanging as a form of capital punishment. These methods differ mainly in the length of the rope used and the mechanics of causing death. In the short drop method, the condemned person is hanged from a relatively short rope without significant distance to fall. This method often results in a slow and painful death by strangulation, as the drop is not sufficient to break the neck. The person's feet might be just above the ground or touching it. It was a more common method in the earlier days of judicial hanging and is considered less humane due to the prolonged suffering it causes. The long drop method was developed later with the aim of providing a more humane and instantaneous death. In this method, calculations are made based on an individual's weight and height to determine the appropriate length of rope, ensuring a quick death by breaking the neck. When the trapdoor opens, the person falls a longer distance, and the sudden stop combined with the length of the fall is meant to cause a rapid fracture dislocation of the neck. This method is significantly quicker than the short drop method, and is generally believed to be less painful. While the long drop method was seen as a thoughtful improvement on the short drop methods, it wasn't without mishaps. A drop that is too long can generate excessive force, leading to decapitation. This results from the noose tightening with such force that it completely severs the head. Decapitation as a result of a too long drop in a judicial hanging is a highly traumatic and gory outcome, both for the deceased and the witnesses. This unfortunate occurrence is the result of excessive force exerted on the neck, leading to the complete severing of the head from the body. Throughout history, there have been instances where such miscalculations and errors in executions led to decapitation, resulting in an unexpected bloody mess. These incidents often brought public outcry and calls for changes in execution methods. The development from the short drop to the long drop method in judicial hangings and inventions like the guillotine reflects our human behavioral evolution in the understanding of human anatomy and desire to make executions as instantaneous and painless as possible. They also come with a recognition of the psychological impact on those involved in the process, including execution personnel and witnesses. While certainly thoughts for the condemned are there, human evolution of judicial execution has also been very focused on making the process easier for society's ever-evolving psyche to bear. These refinements have greatly diminished the occurrence of such incidents in modern times. In many places, a move away from capital punishment altogether has or is occurring. In a bit of saddening irony, humans have worked so hard at making judicial killing easier, more humane, and more painless for all involved. Some of us, anyway, have recognized that the trick is actually not killing people. 
But times were different then. This heinous act not only shattered the peace of Guadu, but also echoed the dangers lurking in seemingly serene rural landscapes and the quickly transforming Victorian era cultures. It would become noteworthy news in several nations, but mainly because of the experiments on the decapitated head of Genyi, a killer recorded through much of history by only one name. This isn't actually a particularly rare thing. It was a period where the media and public were fascinated by the macabre and dramatic elements of criminal cases. The personal stories of victims, especially those from lower classes, were not often given the same attention or empathy that we see in modern times. We saw that with killers as well. The narrative often revolved around the crime and at times the criminal, with less emphasis on the humanizing details of the victim's lives. Gen Yi lost his head and met a grisly fate by the French guillotine. They began tinkering with that severed head within minutes of it being removed from his body. Their tactics involved the infusion of a dog's blood into Genyi's head through the carotid artery, which is a major blood vessel in the neck supplying blood to the brain. This transfusion aimed to stimulate the circulation of blood, potentially reviving some cellular functions temporarily. Remarkably, maybe, when specific nerves were stimulated, there was observable contraction of the eyelids and movements in the lower jaw. Some responses indicated that even after death, some reflex actions could be elicited from the muscles and nerves, albeit without any consciousness or sensory perception. These unsettling experiments were extended to his trunk, his body, and the heart was momentarily revived. The experiments reflect this era's obsession with understanding the human body and the nature of life and death. Such experiments were not uncommon and were driven by a desire to push the boundaries of scientific knowledge, often blurring the lines between ethical research and morbid curiosity. Geographically, while France is of course distinct from the British heartland of the Victorian era, the cultural and scientific currents of the time transcended national borders. The Victorian era was characterized by a shared European interest in scientific inquiry and exploration, including in the field of medicine and human anatomy. This was also a time where, while real science did happen, some of humanity's scientific pursuits were unethical, unhelpful, and sadly even sometimes more reminiscent of a demented butcher with too much time on his hands than a doctor or scientist pursuing enlightenment. The public execution of Genyi and the subsequent scientific experiments highlight the era's punitive approach to crime and its fascination with death. These elements were part of a broader cultural and scientific milieu that was prevalent across Europe. In November 1884, the brutal murder of Miss Emma Kesey, a respected resident of the Glen, Babacombe, and a former lady-in-waiting to Queen Victoria herself, set the stage for a mystery that would captivate and confound. Miss Kesey's body was found in her burned residence and bore horrific signs of violence, a slashed throat and multiple head wounds, suggesting a crime of both passion and desperation. The investigation quickly centered on John Lee, then a young servant to Miss Kesey. The evidence, largely circumstantial, painted a picture of Lee as a predator. A bloody axe matching the wounds on Miss Kesey's body and Lee's own injuries, purportedly sustained while breaking a window during the incident, seemed to seal his fate. Lee's prior criminal record and alleged discontent with his employment further fueled suspicions. Yet Lee's conviction was fraught with controversy. He maintained his innocence, declaring himself wrongly punished and a victim of a hasty and biased judicial process. Public opinion was polarized, with some seeing Lee as a cold-blooded murderer, while others viewed him as a scapegoat of a flawed system. Yet his execution date would come. The saga took an unprecedented turn on the gallows at Exeter Prison in February 1885. In an almost supernatural twist, the execution attempts failed thrice due to gallows malfunction. This was an incredible event, all things considered. James Barry, who we've talked about before, was a famously meticulous executioner. He had tested the gallows and was on hand facilitating the execution. Investigations later would lay possible fault on a specific mechanical issue. But at the time, even for the less caring and less superstitious, did anyone really want to beat the person that tried to kill this guy for a fourth time? The occurrence was so bizarre, it led to some level of public discomfort and a reconsideration of Lee's fate. The sentence was commuted to life imprisonment, with Lee serving his time out at Wormwood Scrubs Prison. But that time to be served wouldn't turn out to be his life. He would see freedom. Lee remained a figure shrouded in mystery. His letters from prison expressed gratitude for the divine intervention he believed saved his life from the noose, and his continuous proclamations of innocence, adding layers to the already complex aura surrounding him. He was released in 1907 and quickly proceeded to sell his story and trade in on the grandeur, being the man that they could not hang. Recent research indicates that he died in the United States in or around 1945. You know how I despise happy endings, but this one, if you choose to call it that, it feels fitting. 
So it's with John Babacombe Lee and the man they could not hang that we depart the Victorian era for today. This bloody and filthy time from history was intense and brutal, but actually I think we've found out today that it also holds some paradoxically precious stories of human resilience, of human change, and of unbelievable second chances. Thank you for joining me today. I've enjoyed our time together. I hope we talked about a few cases that were new to you. They were to me. While tomorrow is promised to no one, I do hope we see each other again for the next one of these very soon. 